So there's the class. If anybody came to add, there's obviously room. Um, attendance in physical attendance is not required. Um, as like all my classes, it'll be uh, streamed and recorded and put on YouTube so you can watch it later or you can connect remotely. But if you show up in person, some people prefer it that way. I prefer classes that way. But anyway, um, all right. Grab one. Question three is the six-digit course code. And that is 0708. I'm Sam Bown, and everything you need for this class is on my website, which is samsclass.info. Normally, I would have a piece of paper with a few things like that on it, but the copiers are all broken, so I'm unable to copy it this week. I imagine I will have the paper to give you next week. But everything is on my website there. And for this class, you click this, obviously, CNET 126, Practical Malware Analysis. If you tried to add this class before and you were on the waiting list, I emailed you an ad code earlier today. So there's probably only a few people that couldn't get on the waiting list that still need an ad code, and I'll probably take care of them at the break. Um, so what we're going to do here, um, this class is one I was very excited to teach because um, malware analysis is a pretty baffling field. At first, my concept of malware analysis was taking a virus, putting it in a disassembler, and having 10,000 lines of assembly code to read. And that is indeed the only way to do it maybe 15 years ago. That's all I knew, and I said, man, you'd have to be a superhero to do that. That would be like a whole thesis project just to figure out one virus. And uh, then I, the European Council, um, the Honey Net Alliance, came to America, which was pretty rare then, and even more rare now, that foreign conferences come here because it's very difficult for them to get in the country. But they did come to San Jose, and I went there and took a class in malware analysis, and I was very impressed that modern tools make it much easier. So I was pleased with it, but I still couldn't teach a class because I didn't have any viruses to analyze. Now, they taught the class using real malware, and if you pay 5,000 bucks and take a SANS class, they use real malware, but I can't be using real malware at a community college. We don't have enough control over things and we'd all end up in trouble. So I needed this book. This book is great because not only does it teach you how to analyze malware, it gives you a bunch of fake viruses to work on that are relatively harmless. Now they are harmless in the sense that they will not spread and infect other people. They are not harmless in the sense that they don't mess up your machine. You're not supposed to run these samples on your real machine you love, although they won't do terrible damage to it. The only irritating thing is they're kind of hard to get off. So. But anyway, what you're supposed to do is run them in a virtual machine if you run them, and we're going to talk about the techniques to analyze them. So um, I was very pleased to do this because, again, about 15 years ago, analyzing viruses was such a rare skill that um, there were only like 10 or 20 people in the world doing it of any importance. And the Russian mobsters that run the spam campaigns that make their money off this stuff found it more useful to just rub out those people one by one. They took one guy and kidnapped his daughter and sold her into slavery to shut him up. Because so few people could do it, it was economically viable for them to just get rid of those people. And I thought the only way to improve this situation is to spread the knowledge more widely so many more people know how to do it. Okay. So that's no longer economically viable. And now, certainly that has happened. None of you are going to get rubbed out just for learning what's in this book. I mean, by the time it's in a book, then obviously thousands of people know it, and anybody can learn it easily. So, but anyway, I wanted to uh, help spread the knowledge as soon as I could. And uh, so now we can. And this is um, another book from Mandiant. Man Mandiant recommends this book. If you want to get a job at Mandiant, they recommend learning techniques in this book before you go there. This is the essential beginning point. And I mentioned in another class, important fact, you are going to see the same material. There are three different ways to learn the same thing. One is Windows development, where you learn how Windows works and what the API is and how to use it to productively do things. Malware analysis is the same information, just learning how to abuse it to do the non-standard things with the same Windows API. And the third way to learn the same thing is exploit development, where you learn how to hack into machines. All these involve learning how software really works from different angles. And it helps to look at it from several different angles. And when I taught this class in China, the students were very smart. And they, um, 
but they'd never done attack. They'd only done productive development and defense. And they said, they hadn't really said, you know, how do you get, how do you understand this stuff so well? And I said, well, you have to look at it from both sides. It helps a lot. This is why you have to do attack and defense. That's what we learned about 10 years ago in colleges, is the teaching people defense only because attack is just for nasty, grubby hackers and we wouldn't want to be like them, is about as useful as having soldiers that learn to defend and they don't learn to, to attack. You just can't do it that way. You've got to do attack and defense if you want to understand how it works. So here we're doing defense, figuring out how malware works. Not writing malware. That's the exploit development class or the ethical hacking classes. All right, so we're going to talk about types of malware, and we'll do the four basic types of malware analysis, which are a basic static analysis, where you analyze a sample without running it and without looking at the code. So you do very simple things, like looking at the readable strings in it, uh, looking at the hash values, sending it up to antivirus engines in hopes that maybe they already did the work for you, and things like that. Then basic dynamic analysis, where you run the malware and let it infect a virtual machine and measure what happens to that virtual machine, which is fun and easy. Um, and then advanced static analysis, which is the process I described at first, where you actually print out all the assembly code and try to read it and figure out what it does, which is burdensome, but will get you the, all the truth eventually. And then advanced dynamic analysis, which is easier, where you run it in a debugger so you can modify the execution and stop the execution partway through. And that's, um, admit, that's another way to figure out what malware does. That technique is very easy. So the, the third technique is by far the most difficult. Fourth technique becomes fun again, and I've used it a lot for a lot of types of malware like PHP malware. Uh, PHP and obfuscated JavaScript just looks like junk, and so the way you de-obfuscate it is you run it halfway through and stop it after it unpacks itself, then you can see what you've got. All right, uh, you have to be in my Canvas class to take quizzes and indeed to get credit for the homework now. So uh, it is not the City College Canvas because they maintain that the same way they maintain their copiers, and I'm not going to use it. They also don't give <coughs> uh, administrative rights over it. So um, you should have received an invitation in your City College email inviting you to my Canvas. I sent them out earlier today. Um, and uh, when you join that, you'll then be in here and you can take quizzes. And you, your homework scores will appear in there, as you'll see. Uh, there's a live stream put out by the college. We're in a recording studio, so this is making high-quality streams. It's actually going on local television in San Francisco. And then it is uh, put on YouTube, which will go up on my page. Uh, when we do the Kahoot, quizzes. In class, the City College stream is not any good because it's delayed by a minute because they have to obey Federal Communication Commission regulations. So if someone were to say a bad word, they'd have to bleep you out. So you have to delay it for that. So that means you can't play the quiz. So you have to use Zoom, uh, a free video conferencing software. I just run Zoom during those quizzes so the remote people have a fair chance. And if you want to email me something, send emails here if it's related to the class um, you are not emailing in homework this semester in this class. I was planning on that, but I realized uh, my old projects from the last time I taught it here are two years old, and everything has changed a lot since then, so I'm just going to the projects I used in China, and those are structured like a CTF. So I'm putting them in the API and feed straight into Canvas, which I had not planned to do for this class, but now I see it is the best way to get the right version of the projects available to you. So there's a bunch of quizzes and a bunch of homework due, and it adds up to a bunch of points. And I have a grading policy, which I'll have on paper next time, although it's pretty dull stuff. And uh, so there's a bunch of quizzes and a bunch of projects. Uh, the total number of points of projects will be somewhat different than this, because as I say, the projects are changing. But anyway, projects, final exam, bunch of quizzes, and a bunch of points. 90% is an A, 80% is an B, and so on. That's all there is to it, really. Um, and if anybody does something rotten like cheat, then I can kick them out of the class or give them an F or something. Hopefully we won't have that nonsense going on. All right. Uh, so that's, I think, it for the structure. Are there any questions? Well, let me just start with the first chapter then. First two chapters are here. One thing to notice is if you get the electronic book, the chapter numbers are different by one than the paper book. There's always something. So that's why I always quote the complete title of the chapter so you know which one it is. Anyway. So here's the goals of malware analysis. Um, I have a student who took off and formed a one consulting company and started doing tech support for all kinds of people, did all sorts of stuff, and he called me one day and said, I'm working in a hospital, 
They got all these computers. They had an infection on one computer. So I went there, clean off the infection. They say, okay, you're done. And I'm leaving. And I said, you know, I don't feel like the job is really done. How do we know that it didn't spread? How do we know they didn't get the medical data? I don't feel like, I don't feel right about just leaving, but they said I'm done. And I said, you're right. You're not right to leave. And if they make you leave, then at least write a letter to them. So you have in writing, I warned them. <laughs> because this is not the end of the problem. This is the case with everybody. They have some kind of intrusion. They find uh, somebody using an account that they're not supposed to be using. They find some malware. Then what do you know? You really, your boss really ought to be asking questions like, how many machines are infected? What has the criminal stolen? How do you really know they're gone? If you clean off that one machine, do you really know they're gone? Or do they have other footholds in the network? Those are really good questions, and those are hard questions to answer. And we're talking about it in the incident response class, and it's in the forensic classes here. That's, this is a tough job. How do you find out what happened to your machines? But that's incident response. So these are very sensible things that you want to know. And you really want to get down to root cause analysis. You want to understand how they got in so you can kick them out and close the door so they can't come right back in at least the same way. Uh, LinkedIn is a fine example of this. LinkedIn got hacked maybe six or seven years ago. Um, all their password hashes were stolen. And the criminals that stole it were relatively incompetent. So they took 60,000 password hashes that they couldn't crack and they posted them on a bulletin board in Russia saying, can somebody help us crack these? And I looked on the dump and every, everyone said, LinkedIn's been hacked and everybody and LinkedIn said, no, we haven't been hacked. And so I looked in the password hash and my password hash was there and I was able to crack it, which is pretty dumb because I'm not, no, I don't have any fancy rig or anything. And it was my password, my real password. Like 20 other security professionals did the same thing. We contacted LinkedIn, dude, these are your passwords. They totally stole your passwords. And LinkedIn said, no, 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 we didn't get hacked. But after about a week, they couldn't lie about it anymore. So they admitted they'd been hacked. And then they said, well, we asked our lawyer. And our lawyer said, you know, there's nothing personal on LinkedIn anyway. All people do is put up their resume hoping to get a job. Who cares? So we don't have to do anything. We're like, dude, you can't just do nothing. I mean, you're just going to let the criminals live in your network and take whatever they want forever. You're not even going to kick them out. That can't be right. But they maintained that position for several months. And eventually, somebody persuaded them they really had to clean it up. And they had to spend a million bucks or more in upgrades to actually kick them out. Um, this does raise a lot of interesting issues, one of which is it's not entirely clear that you're legally obligated to do anything about it. <laughs> Depends on what kind of data you have. You are required to notify people if you lose their personal data. But, um, you know, I don't suppose there's a law saying you can't have criminals with root access on your servers exactly. Anyway, um, but you'd like to think it'd be bad for PR or something. However, this is related to another nasty thing about this business. If you want to ask how much a breach costs, nobody has any clue. There are examples of breaches that cost $200 per record. There are examples of breaches that cost 50 cents per record. And if you think it's going to affect your stock price, the evidence is strongly against you. Um, TJ Maxx got hacked and within a month their stock was right back where it was. In fact, I was happier shopping there after that because I figured they actually did something to improve their security. The other people probably get still getting hacked and don't even know it. It's it's very unclear. Anyway, that's, that's where we're at. So uh, anyway, if you get on an instant response team or antivirus company or something, you want to analyze malware, this is a, a job. Once you find a malware sample, you would like to figure out how it works. Now, you don't want to spend forever analyzing it. Um, you want to have a quick uh, result. So the important lesson here, which was very difficult for me, is that you have to limit your goals. I came from the world of math and physics, and I had a well-established habit for my whole life. Whenever I study anything, I would read one sentence, and I'd make sure I understand it 100% before I would proceed to the next sentence. Every, everything on one page had to be absorbed before I go to the next page. You, that's how you do math and physics, because they are hundreds of years old, and they have been perfected until they really have put everything you need in the right order. But malware analysis is not that way at all. You are always going to be confronted with far too much information, baffling complexity, and you don't have time to understand it all. So you have to skim through it and find a few interesting points and focus on what's interesting and accept that most of it you'll never figure out. There's another thing, too. You're fighting against intelligent criminals, so all your tools are going to be broken, and they are going to lie to you frequently. And they're going to fail to find the things because the bad guys are putting in anti-forensic techniques. So 
If anything is not working or confusing you, just forget it and go on to the next technique. If it's either just because you're too stupid or your tool doesn't work or something, nothing is ever going to be 100%. And this, I think, is getting you used to the world of management where you don't even know what's going on. People come telling you things, a lot of that information is wrong, and yet you somehow have to make decisions. So you have to accept um, sort of haze. You see a little bit of information through the haze, and that's all you can get. So you, what you really want to know about malware is not everything about it. You want to know what harm it did, how to clean it off, and how to detect the other infected machines, and that's about it. So there's your goals, what you'd like to know. Um, contain the damage and find some kind of signature. These are called indicators of compromise that you can use to find the infected machines. Host-based signatures are the most common. These are uh, not usually the structure of the malware file itself, but the things it changes on the system. Things like registry keys, uh, mutexes in RAM, which are handles that sit in the file system for processes to share, or network traffic. Things you can easily detect by sending a query to the machine saying, tell me if you have this registry key and then the answer to that will tell you if it's infected. A network traffic is, of course, very nice because you don't even have to query the machine. You can just look on your network for which ones are sending out that traffic. That makes it easy to spot them. If they'll do something so friendly as actually send like a DNS query to a known command and control server, that's really handy for finding the bad ones. Um, if you do it wrong, you create a mess. This is what happened to our college a few years back. We had a crooked a chief technology officer who hired his crooked partner who was a, a fake malware analyst of sorts. And he had a secret proprietary network forensic system that he wouldn't let anybody tell, but he would brag about how it had secret information from the FBI and the NSA and everybody. And so he took all our network traffic and sent it through his mysterious system and claimed that he found 5,000 viruses on our 10,000 computers. And he, found, he claimed to find viruses that were 10 years old. And from that, he concluded that all our machines had been infected for 10 years and we hadn't cleaned any of them. And uh, this immediately, our, our CTO did not tell anyone at the college at all, but immediately went to the press to try to create a fake virus scandal so he could be a hero. And it took about the next year and a half for me at the head of a large lynch mob to get him fired and removed. But um, it was interesting to watch. And one of the many things it did wrong was it claimed that we had 200 Windows viruses on our Unix DNS servers. So that's obviously wrong. And this is what happens with many malware detection tools. They often Say you're infected when you aren't. That's one. If you think about it, you get some kind of anti-malware tool, you run it. If it says nothing, you say, well, I wasted my money. So they always sell them to you with the sensitivity turned up so high that it will say something. You know this if you run like a spyware finder. It'll tell you you have 300 spywares. Well, they're all just tracking cookies. They don't really matter, but it has to tell you something. So be aware of that. So like I mentioned, these are the basic techniques. Static analysis, you look at the malware without running it. So you look at the strings, you send it up to VirusTotal, which is a Google service that indexes all the viruses known to the top 50 or 60 antivirus companies, or uh, perhaps a disassembler, although you usually wouldn't do that at this level. And then dynamic analysis, you run it and deliberately infect a virtual machine and see what happens in that virtual machine. Um, and basic static is where you look at the malware. Uh, wait a minute, I've been here. Same thing twice? What am I doing here? All right. Yeah, that's the basic static. All right. Then advanced static is where you look with IDA Pro, and advanced dynamic is where you run it in a debugger, like Ollie Debug. So you can modify the execution, and we'll do all of these things. All right. And of course, there's the types of malware, which you probably already know. Uh, backdoors let the attacker control the system. Botnets create machines that are in constant network traffic with the command and control center, which can then issue orders to them and have them all do things like denial of service attacks. Downloaders are uh, programs that then download more malware. Almost all malware is staged. Most Metasploit payloads are staged because usually when you find an exploit, you can only inject a small amount of code, like maybe 50 or 100 bytes. So that's not enough to really put exciting malware on there. It's enough to put just a few commands that will download more malware, and then maybe download more. Often there are two or three stages of downloading more and more to get to where you have a fully featured botnet control center there that can do whatever you want. Then there's ones that steal passwords or keys, keylog, and launchers that launch other programs, often trying to launch them in sneaky ways with techniques like process replacement we'll talk about, where you change the RAM, but you do not change the hard disk file to try to avoid detection. Windows, unfortunately, makes that very easy to do. And then there's rootkits, which are how you maintain permanent ownership of a machine 
you subvert the operating system at its most fundamental level so that the machine remains under control even when they have serious attempts to clean it off. Uh, nothing can really get rid of a rootkit except a full re-image typically. And uh, when done correctly, they're very hard to detect. And then there's scareware that try to scare people. This one's pretty good. The one of the one would pop up and say that uh, we've detected you watching porn on this machine. And one guy got so scared he turned himself in for, for child porn. Uh, the, more, the modern technique, uh, until about a year and a half ago, the number one money-making technique was ransomware, encrypting your files and charging money to take it off. Now, that's gone down a lot because, in fact, it's very easy to detect that. Once you think of looking for it, a process that tries to encrypt every file on your hard drive is actually very easy. And Microsoft Windows 10 has a defense that came out about a year ago. You can define a properties on a folder. If you have a folder full of Word documents, you can put a property on the folder that says only Microsoft Word is allowed to change these files. And then the malware can't encrypt those files. It's actually quite easy, once you think of it, to stop ransomware from, from infecting your machine. So it's going downhill, and now the most popular uh, money maker is uh, cryptocurrency mining, Monero made. A spam used to be the number one way to make money out of an infected machine. Um, it may be hard to believe from all of us who ignore 100 spams a day, but there are clowns that click on those links and buy those pills and stuff in the spam, enough that if you spend on a million spams, some money comes in. And then, of course, worms and viruses that infect a machine and spread over network connections to infect other machines. Uh, the most common type of malware is, of course, mass malware, where you send thousands of, or millions of copies of the same file to every machine, and that's what antivirus does. Antivirus is a very weak defense. It is very stupid, and pretty much the only thing it does is stop mass malware, where a million machines all get exactly the same file. Then it looks for a pattern of bytes in the file, and it can remove it. And, of course, that's a common type of attack, and you want to stop it. But any attacker even a little smarter than that that customizes the attack can pretty much sail right through it. And that's targeted malware like Stuxnet and many others. Stuxnet being the example of the most advanced ones that would use zero days and very clever techniques. There's almost no way to stop that kind of attack. Um, so almost anybody can stop this stuff with just antivirus. Really, nobody can stop this stuff except the largest corporations or the military. And most of us are somewhere in between. At a business, we, we don't really expect to stop major espionage agents from foreign adversaries, but we would like to stop more than just the garden variety criminals. So you adjust your, you do threat modeling to figure out what you're afraid of and what you can possibly afford to stop, and then you put in whatever procedures are required to suit your threat model. So here's general rules. Uh, don't get bogged down in details. If you see a screen full of far too much information that makes you sick, don't let it stop you. Just read whatever you can read. It's good to think about a small child that can't read and all they do is look at the pictures. Look on the screen to see if there's any part of it you can understand and move on. Don't get bogged down. We'll do a lot of that. Try several tools. The tools are all buggy. None of them are really more advanced than maybe a beta test version. And all the malware is deliberately there to wreck your tools, wreck the OS, and hide from them. So none of them are going to work all the time anyway. So you have to just have a wide variety of tools, even if they do pretty much the same thing, to, to get the answer. All right, and we're down to the first Kahoot. The Kahoots are online quizzes. They're worth extra credit. You don't have to do them, but they usually help prevent people from falling asleep. Perhaps I forgot to put them up. All right, I guess we'll do them next time. I'm really logged in as me. I think I am. Such is life. All right, somehow I don't have them. We will charge ahead. All right. Got a little more time. All right, so, so basic static analysis. Um, you run it through antivirus, you calculate a hash of the file and see if it's known, and then you can look at the strings, functions, and headers. Strings are the readable strings inside a file, and functions and headers are also readable and easily retrieved from a file. So if you want to do antivirus scanning, you could run antivirus of yourself, but usually you send it up to VirusTotal. Now, one thing to know about VirusTotal is that if you send them a file and they don't recognize it, they will send copies of the file to the antivirus companies. And they will record the fact that this file has been analyzed, so anybody on Earth can send up another copy of the same file and it will tell them, oh, this file was already analyzed at this time and date. So if you are afraid of an advanced persistent threat and you think that someone is targeting you specifically, your attacker will watch Virus Total to see when a sample is sent up there, and if you do that, you will tip them off that you're onto them. So it is considered a failure of operational security to use Virus Total in this manner. So if you are concerned about 
informing the attacker that you know they've attacked you, then um, use virus total by calculating the hash of a file and querying for the hash, because they cannot send the hash to a company to analyze, and you can see if they know about the file, which is what, and that will not tip anybody off. So that's the right way to use it if you're worried about that. Hashes are fingerprints for malware. Most people still use MD5 or SHA-1. Both of these are not mathematically perfect hashes, but in practice, they're very good. It is possible to make another file with the same MD5 or SHA-1, but it's not easy and most people don't bother. Um, anyway, so hash calc is a Windows tool. Windows, unfortunately, does not include a hash calculator, so this is one of many free ones. I like this one. Uh, don't use uh, SpyBot. SpyBot has a hash calculator that actually gives you the wrong hash values, which is mighty rude. It's not that hard, but anyway. Um, so this is a way to, ha there should be hashes on things anytime you're going to try to transmit it to somebody else and you want to make sure they got it intact. And then there's strings. Um, you can just look through a file and find a series of ASCII characters. ASCII doesn't use all possible values of a byte. Uh, really only the printable characters are about from 32 to 126 or so. So uh, if you find um, readable characters of a length five or six or longer, then most of them are strings. Some of them are just random bytes that happen to look like strings, but that's one way to do it. However, the tool strings itself, which is a common Linux tool and has a Windows port, is in fact not much use for Windows malware because Microsoft does not use ASCII very much. Microsoft is an international operating system and it supports all the languages in the world, so it uses 16-bit Unicode characters, so it's a lot better to use bin text, which is a McAfee tool that can see Unicode. And so here's what um, bad looks like in ASCII, but here's what it looks like in Unicode, and uh, it's quite different. So anyway, uh, strings is native in Linux, and it will you run strings on a, f on a file or the Windows portion, and you'll see a lot of uh, messages in here. These are the names of libraries used by the Windows file, and there's other things down there. Bin text is the tool I prefer that can do um, ASCII or Unicode. And you see it's very nice. It has the GUI that you, Windows people like to see. And then there's another issue, which is that malware is often packed. Uh, you pack it just to make it smaller, and you also pack it to conceal the strings. WinZip is a simple packer we're all used to, and that makes a file smaller, and it does make the strings unreadable, but that's a little more obvious, so there are other kinds of packers. They all take the original executable, pack it somehow, and put some kind of unpacker in front. So you'll see that in a few minutes. Um, PEID is a useful tool to try to guess what language a file is written. So it'll detect the language it's written in if possible, and it will detect some unpackers, like the UPX unpacker. UPX is a common open source Packer. All right, and we'll look at this a little later. Um, so if you run strings on the packed file, you'll see many, many fewer strings. Um, by the way, PEID will sometimes run the malware. So anytime you're doing any kind of analysis on malware, you should really be working in a virtual machine that you can throw away. Uh, even when you do relatively harmless things, you often discover that you're running parts of the malware. This is also true, I've discovered, of PHP and JavaScript malware. I often run it in a browser and tried to stop it and discovered that by accident I stopped it at the wrong spot when it had not only unpacked but also done some of the harm. So anytime you're working with malware, you should be using a throwaway machine. Yeah? Uh, should you separate the VM from the network? Um, you could. Most people don't bother. It would be more perfect to. But most people just don't care because it's not that common that it escapes in there. Another issue, by the way, is uh, there's, especially now, unfortunately, in the age of Spectre and Meltdown, there are a lot of VM escape attacks, where it can escape from the virtual machine and affect the host. Um, so be aware of that. Yeah? How does it do that? How does it uh, out of the sandbox? Spectre and Meltdown uh, make it possible to do it with speculative execution. That's why Microsoft has been struggling mightily to patch it all this year with enormous failure. Um, it's fundamentally um, all, there used to be techniques based on defects in the virtualization software. Like one technique was there were buffer overflows in the virtual floppy drive that was included. So you could uh, escape that way. But the modern problem is all CPUs manufactured in the last 10 years, their security is broken by Spectre and Meltdown. The optimization features added to make them run faster 
cause it to execute instructions in groups, pipelining maybe 20 deep. So when it executes an instruction, it has already begun to execute 10 or 20 instructions after that one. So if this instruction creates an exception, saying you're not allowed to access that, it has already happened. And when it tries to undo those steps, it does not undo it thoroughly. So there are traces left that can be picked up. So um, that's, in the current situation, uh, it's probably a little more dangerous than it used to be. However, most malware is not up to using those techniques yet. And Microsoft is putting out an endless chain of buggy patches, frequently having to recall them and patch the patch and so on to try to fix these problems. Uh, the fundamental rule we've all learned over the last year is we're pretty much hosed. Our hardware is shot. There's no processor that is immune for Spectre meltdown. There is nothing you can buy to replace it with. And there's no real fix until you replace your hardware with hardware that does not exist yet. So all we're doing now is patching the current attacks that have been developed so far. But we are not really fixing the fundamental problem. And so we're all, uh, of course, that's the way it's always been. There's all kinds of bugs, there's all kinds of holes, and you, you patch them up the best you can, and you just try to keep going. But anyway, um, it certainly is the case. The, the malware we're going to use is this relatively harmless stuff that isn't going to escape a VM. It is possible that malware could escape a VM. It is so. If you are afraid of that, you might actually want to isolate the machine entirely, physically, from the network with an air gap. There are a few people who claim to have found malware that can go across an air gap, but most of us don't take that as a credible threat. We did it to Iran. We infected their nuclear isotope separators across an air gap by using four zero days and DIL files on a USB stick that was carried in with the USB. And there's a guy in Canada that claims he's got malware on a Mac that is infecting other machines by sending sound out. Uh, but I don't think too many people believe him. If they were going to start doing that, then it's getting really scary. But as far as anybody knows, if there are any attacks like that, they're pretty exotic and they're not wasting it on us low-level attackers. Probably only people with nuclear secrets, I would think. Yeah? Is that the sound of the fans? So What's that? Is that the sound of the fans? The sound of the fan is one way, the sound from the coil is another way, even ultrasonic sound through the speaker is another way. You could certainly write malware that does send signals that way and put it on the box, but it's not clear how you could deliver malware. I don't understand how you'd have a listening process to pick it up at the other end without having infected it. There are certainly things like that that send like ultrasonic beeps back and forth. That can be done, but that doesn't put malware on, that's just a covert channel of communication. Anyway, Windows executables, uh, libraries and executable files are portable executable files. This is the format they have, PE files. It's a data structure. And um, it has a header that tells it information about it. And this is necessary because Microsoft Windows uses dynamic linking. So every program is not complete. The program has part of the code, and it uses libraries to do the rest. So it has to know what libraries it's supposed to load. So uh, Lord PE is one of many programs that can examine a file and um, we'll look at it a little more later. But you can see the main sections here, text, data, resource, and relocation. Uh, these are the sections in this particular file, which is Notepad. The text section contains executable code, and the other sections contain things like readable text and icons and such. Um, and there are, can be many more sections. You almost always have a text. You all, in fact, you have to have a text section and a few others. But you could have many more sections. Uh, there's no particular limit to how many you have. All right, and say so we'll have to do these next time. Somehow I don't have them ready. When you use a library from inside an executable, then you are importing that function. Now, there are three ways to do this. Static linking is what Linux programs typically use until the very latest version. So if I have a program that uses a network connection, it imports the library and adds it into the code. So my code is this much and the library is here. And if another program is launched using the network library, it makes another copy of the whole library. This means programs use more RAM, and they take longer to load, um, and, but they're independent. One program is running and the other is running, so if something happens to this one, it doesn't affect the other one. Microsoft prefers dynamic linking. This is what DLL stands for, Digital Dynamically Linked Library. And the point is, if one program uses network sockets, it connects to the network library, and if another program launches and wants to do networking, it attaches to the same copy of the same library in RAM. And it attaches dynamically while running. It says, oh, I need a library. I'll connect to it. This means the code you're running is not all included in the executable you launched. And this is the number one way malware works. It tricks Windows into loading an additional library or a fake library. So we add code to something that's not malware that's running. That's DIL injection, and that's how almost all malware works. 
So that's the game. Um, runtime linking. And you can do this with load library and get process address. There's our API calls. Everything you do in Windows is done by calling APIs. Microsoft Windows gives you a series of functions you can call to do things like open a window, take a key, press, send network traffic, save a file. All these things are done by Windows and you just call them as a developer, sending it the right arguments to do what you want. And of course this dynamic linking is why you'll see this nonsense frequently on Windows. You're missing a DIL file because the program tries to run but now it needs a library and it can't find a library. All versions of Windows have been perennially suffered from this bug where they keep on not having the library you need, and it's been driving us all nuts since Windows 98. All right, so the PE header has to tell the executable every library it needs. And so here, a lot of them you can read nicely. URL download to file, it's pretty obvious what that does. Most Microsoft library API calls are that clear. It's quite obvious what they do, and they're written in plain English. So just looking in the header of the PE file gives you a pretty good idea what the program is doing. Dependency Walker is a program intended to help developers deal with that problem where you can't find the libraries and your code crashes. So Dependency Walker will load a file and then show you all the other libraries it's using. If you have a, here's, here's a good services.exe which is used to launch a bunch of background services in Windows and is connected to everything. But it, uh, one thing malware frequently does is make a file with a name very close to a legitimate Windows file to fool you. So here's services.ex underscore, and you can tell it's fishy because it only has two things underneath it instead of 20 or 30. Uh, this is commonly the case. Just a cursory look at what kind of libraries are being used by malware gives you a clue that something's wrong with it. So dependency walker, if you load, here's one of the files we're going to analyze a little later. Um, you have imports and exports. These are the actual functions being used by the program, so you can see which functions are used. You do not get the exact command with the function and the argument, but you get the name of the functions it's using, and you can make some guesses about what it's going to do from that. So here's a few of the more common libraries. Kernel32.dil is the uh, Windows kernel. Uh, it lets you manipulate files and memory. NTOS kernel is actually the kernel, but kernel32 is a library leading into the kernel. Advanced API gives you things like service manager and registry. User32 gives you ways to interface with the user with boxes and buttons and windows. GDI is used for graphics, graphic display interface. NTDIL is the interface to the Windows kernel. Um, you normally don't import this directly. Instead, you import kernel32. Kernel32 is the one Windows intends you to use. Now, we're going to hit this a lot in the rest of this course. Microsoft has a lot of secrets. Microsoft has a bunch of API calls that they want you to do. This is something Microsoft's been doing as far as back, maybe at least 15, 20 years. I've been doing Microsoft tech support. They have an official way to do things, which is usually a huge pain. You have to sign it. And then there is an unofficial, better way to do it that they don't want you to use. And they try to keep it secret. And they try to discourage you. And all the people pretty much wise up to the fast, easy way to do it. And they do it that way. And Microsoft just gets mad. And so they have secret API calls, which have all leaked out, which are used by malware authors and by advanced developers and by Microsoft internally. And then there's the official API. So you're supposed to use NTDIL. Um, wait, you're supposed to use kernel32.dil. But if you're a malware writer, you might just load NTDIL and use it directly. This is also called like the native API, where you call the uh, small functions underlying things instead of the big functions Microsoft actually wants you to use. Anyway, here's uh, Windows socket libraries. These call network tasks. And here's WinINet. These are raw uh, sockets, making raw socket connections, um, which is straight from Unix. The internet is a Unix production. Microsoft ignored it completely until about Windows 98. And so all these standards, the names, the libraries, and everything were defined by Unix. And this is why you will find a driver's ETC folder in Windows which is a Linux name, and the contents are straight from Linux because Microsoft just had to copy Linux code to get on the internet because they didn't join the game early enough to be involved. And this is the basic raw sockets that you'll find in Python or any other language. Uh, therefore, people don't usually use these. They usually use a higher level library like WinINet that will do something like download a file from a URL with one call. This one will require you to do the handshake and then send the request and then process the response, and you normally uh, want Windows to do all that for you automatically. 
So DILs export functions, so they offer services to other programs. EXEs import functions, trying to get functions in the DIL that they're going to uh, use. And so here's notepad.exe. Here's its import address table. It uses all these different functions. Registry, query, value, is text, unicode. Here's that advanced API.dil, to so draw little icons on the screen or something. And all these various functions it uses. Here's advapi.dil. This is a dil, so it exports all these functions. This is just the first little bit of the A's. Thousands or hundreds of functions that it provides to others. You can call all those functions if you connect to this library. And that's how you would do any kind of graphic manipulation. Here's iTunes setup to install it. Here's the, uh, in this PE view, you see this is just the raw hex dump of the program. This is the, every program in Windows executable starts with MZ, then it has this program, cannot be run in DOS mode. This you might remember from looking at floppy disks and a raw disk. This is the way Windows executables have been from the times of MS DOS. And they're still obeying the same format. Um, this is the raw hex. And here's the header part uh, broken up into sections so you can see what libraries it's importing and what functions it's using in those libraries and a few other things. So a keylogger might use the user interface and use set windows hook EX. Windows supports hooking. So you can tell it, add another process that you call before doing something else. This is for things like antivirus. Before you open that file, call me. So you can use hooking to capture key presses. This will export uh, some <coughs> mouse procs to send the data elsewhere and use register hotkey or so on. These are some examples of how you might have a key logger that uses the API. Here's a packed program that uses only a few calls. That's not enough to get much of anything done because if it's packed, the only thing you can see is the unpacker. When it unpacks, it will have another program appear in memory, but that's not what you see if you examine the hard disk file, the launcher. Text is the part that has instructions for the CPU to execute. Our data is imports and exports. Here's global data. Here's strings and icons and so on in the resource section. And PE view gives you a good look into them. I'm, after we take a break, I'll demonstrate these things in the first couple projects. Um, here you can see a time and date stamp. If you read Kaspersky, antivirus analyses, they published a very good blog of them. They love this thing. They look at the time and date stamp, and you can tell if several files were part of the same malware package because they're all compiled within a few seconds of each other. And you can tell what country compiled the malware because it's being done during working hours, either in Washington or in China or in Moscow. This is, of course, easy to fake, but in practice, it's a part of attribution. That's the game of attribution, which is pretty much a guessing game of which nation is attacking you. And most of us in the corporate world, we just don't care which nation is attacking us. We just want to keep them out. But the spies and the government and the military actually want to track it down. I mean, if I prove that North Korea is attacking me, how does that benefit me? Instead of it being Texas that's attacking me, I really don't care. I just want to block them. Um, anyway, so uh, that tells you when it was compiled. But you can have, of course, put any wrong date there. And some programs always put a wrong date there, like Delphi. Uh, all right, another thing to know is the virtual size and the size of the raw data. Um, most files have about the same file, size on a disk and size in RAM, but packed files don't. That's one clue for them. So here's not packed. The virtual size is A68C and the size of raw data is A800. So they're quite similar, but here's a, um, a packed file and the uh, virtual size is 8,000, but the raw data is zero. So that means that the size, when it actually expands, will change a lot, which is what you'll get for a pack. <coughs> resource Hacker will let you look in the resource section. It's used uh, to change the icons on games and such. It looks like that. All right. And that's it for the first couple chapters. So I just want to demonstrate the first couple projects, which I think you'll have fun with. But let's take a break. It's about 7. I'll take a break till 7.10. <coughs> and if anybody needs an ad code, come on up and I'll bring you one. And if you filled out those forms, you should pile them up. I'll just start a couple piles on a table here. This looks good. OK, pile them up there. Uh, go here and download this 2008 machine. It's, if this class, it's important that you use exactly my machine because I've already installed all the tools you need. And that will save you a lot of bother. Because a lot of these tools are really irritating to install. They don't install correctly. They don't add to the program menu. You have to write a little batch file to launch them and all that junk. Yeah? 
And do you have to register through Windows for it? Or no, you know, no, you don't. This is pirate software. Okay. It's Windows with no product key, and it will complain about that. But if you just wait 15 seconds, you can start it anyway. So, and it's the same machine I use in other classes. So if you need a 2008 for DNS, you can use this one. And I'll put this information on the DNS site, too. I used to put it behind a password, and lately I didn't bother. And Microsoft hasn't yelled at me yet, so I'm just hitting me to do it. So once you get it, you can put it in VMware, VirtualBox, or even Hyper-V, if anybody's using Hyper-V. And once you've got a virtual machine of 2008 running, it'll look like this. The background will go black to punish you for not having a product key. But other than that, it will work. And you have a folder on your desktop called Practical Malware Analysis. And that is the malware to analyze. And all the tools you need are already installed and will launch from the Start button. So here's the first couple projects. And um, let me show you a few. So first thing, you could send this thing up to VirusTotal if you like. And we will find, of course, that it has been analyzed long ago in 2013. And a few antivirus engines regarded as malicious. But that's not very interesting. Let's take a look at PEView, the first file, which is, uh, I think, lab0101.exe. Um, lab0101.exe. All right, so let's open PEView. <coughs> PEView and lab0101.exe. All right, so I'll zoom in if I can get this thing. To, there we go. So, all right. So here you see the raw um, hexadecimal version of this program. And here's the ASCII version. And here's the headers. And you can see text data and R data. Here's the NT headers. And here's the image file header. This has got the date, date timestamp 2010, 12, 19, and so on. And it should have imports someplace. Here's the import address table. So here you can see the actual functions it uses, create file mapping, create file, find next file, copy file. So from this, you can begin to guess what it's going to do. It's apparently going to hunt through a directory looking for a certain file and make a file if it doesn't find it or something. And you're just guessing, of course. You haven't really seen the flow chart and the exact instructions, but it does something involved find a file, find next file, copy file. That gives you some information about what it's doing. All right. And PEID is another way to look at the structure of a portable executable file. And this one focuses mainly on figuring out what language it was written in. So PEID, you can open the same file, which is desktop, malware, binary, chapter 1, lab01.exe, and see it can detect that it was written with Microsoft Visual C++ 6. So this was written in C++, compiled, and not hidden or obfuscated in any way. And you can do a few more things here. You can see the sections. I don't want to do that. Pardon me. Um, they're here. Here you can see text R data and data and how big they are and so on. And again, the, the virtual size and the real size are quite similar the raw size, and that's to be expected in a malware that has not been packed or hidden in any particular way. So that was easy enough. Now we can look at strings. This is probably the most fun of static analysis because it's so easy and you learn so much. So the tool to use is this McAfee tool called Bintext for Windows software. Browse and open that file, lab01.exe, and go. And now it gives you a nice Windows graphical environment that shows you the strings. Here's that string you see in everything. This program cannot be run in, in DOS mode. Here's the name of the sections, text, R data, and data. And down here, you see Windows API calls. You get used to recognizing these things. Windows function API calls all look like this. They have capitalized each word. They give a nice name that tells you what it is, like create file, find close, find next file. And they often end with A or W or EX. A means it uses ASCII, W means it uses wide characters, Unicode, EX means it is an extended version of some earlier version, and sometimes you even see EX, EX, because things have been through many versions. Here's some libraries, kernel 32 and MSVCRT. There's malloc, so it's going to, so again, just from the strings. Now, this is by very superficial analysis, I don't even know 
that it's really calling the close handle API. All I know is it has that sequence of bytes somewhere in the file. But usually that means it's calling the close handle. So I can see the names of the libraries, names of functions it calls. And again, I can make the same kind of deduction here. And what's even more fun is you can look, sometimes you can find indicators of compromise just right here. Like right here, um, here's kernel32.dil, which is a Windows library, and here is kerny132.dil. Now that's pretty good and suspicious. That's a deceptive name to look like a Windows name, but not really a Windows name. That is very likely to mean that this malware is going to create a file like that. And in fact, I can even get the whole path. See Windows System 32, kernel32, and here's kerny132. So that gives me a pretty good guess that I will find that file on the infected machines. And that's what I love. Something I can, a very simple thing. I don't need the whole disk image or anything ridiculous. I can just say, do you have that file? Because there's no good reason to have a Kearney 132 file. And if you do, that probably means you're infected. So that's very useful. How about the warning, this will destroy your machine? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's another thing. But of course, now that's a message that it'll pop up. But you might not be able to easily detect that. That's why a file or registry key is better for, for handy. But that's right, that's, that's another clue that it's probably malware. And then if I go down here, I might even find like a URL or something. But no, I didn't see any URLs or any internet functions. So this stuff does not appear to phone home. Um, but it does appear to do something, threaten to destroy your machine, and it puts that one file there. I didn't see any registry keys here or anything. So, you know, it's, um, but I found one thing that looks, looks somewhat useful. All right. Um, all right. And then there's dependency walker. Let's take a look at that. Labo101.exe. Dependency walker. <coughs> Labo101.exe. All right. And so here I can see, let me zoom in as much as I can. This uses only two libraries, kernel32.dil and msvcrt.dil. But those call other libraries. And if I click on the library, I'll get the exact function it uses. So now I see the same thing I saw before. It's calling copy file, find close, find first file, find next file. But now I'm not just finding those strings. I know it's really calling that function. Although I did discover this by looking at the header with PE view also. And um, I think I can see a little more here. Let me go to my instructions. Yeah, I can see string comparison in the MSV CRT. Yeah, down here, there I can see um, string comparison here. This is a, a low-level string comparison. So apparently it's going through the files, reading the name and comparing it to some name, looking for a certain file, probably that kerny132.dil to see if it's there. Uh, this is another important thing to know about malware. When you get box gets infected, it is very likely should be infected again by the same thing. The same guy will open another email or click on it again because it didn't seem to work the first time or something. So the first thing malware usually does is check to see if this box is already infected, which is handy for us. That means the first thing it does is often look for the same indicators of compromise that we're looking for. So anyway, uh, that's convenient. All right, and here's find first file and find next file. And I found some networking sockets in the library that goes with it. This file comes in two pieces, labo101.exe and labo101.dil, which I haven't looked at yet. So let's look at that in dependency walker. Labo101.dil, here it is. This uses a lot more libraries. And here it is using ws232.dil, and that's a network library. And if you look down here, it's a low-level network library. These are the names you will get used to if you do any Python coding or anything. Accept, bind, connect, get peer name, get sock name. These are the raw Berkeley standard library calls to make network connections on the internet. So this is the low-level library. As I mentioned, the high-level library a normal person would use is winnet.dil. It has a command like download file from URL. This let you make a socket, you have to specify the port number, then you have to send a command, you know, the kind of thing that a normal person wouldn't bother doing. But a malware writer might well do it in order to create some unusual kind of network traffic, like network traffic that looks like DNS but is not DNS, or looks like HTTP but is not really HTTP, which is commonly what you do in malware. You take the data, you hit commands to the command and control server, or stolen passwords, and you encrypt them and you put them in traffic that looks like normal traffic. So 
it looks like you're just resolving a long random domain name, but in fact that's commands going back to the command and control server and so on. All right. So you got a couple of, uh, that's all just practice. And down here you have a couple of challenges. You can solve these and get your name in the scores. When I get my software working, this will put your scores right in Canvas. People are telling me even when they put in their name, it can't find them. So I have to debug my Canvas API, which I was hoping to dodge in this class, but there's no escaping it. So I will let you know how that works out. Hopefully by next week, I'll have these projects working better. If you do, get the right answer, but you can't turn them in, write down the right answer, and I'll try and get this stuff fixed by next week. People are complaining with good reason. And then I got one here that you have to unpack. So uh, if you look at Lab 0102 with bin text, there's only a few strings. So let's go back to bin text. And bin text is here. And if I open Lab 0101 like we did before and go, just notice that um, there are many screens of text of, of uh, strings in this thing. But if I open Lab 0102 and go, there's quite a bit less. And this is a packed executable. So all I'm seeing is the unpacker. So I'm seeing get system time, a couple of Windows system calls like msvcrt load library, create process, internet open, not what I expected, but anyway. Um, all right, those are the strings, no URLs, no file names. So since it's packed, um, let's go take a look at PEID, which is the program that tells us what language it's written in. PEID. And Lab 0102 is desktop malware binary chapter one, Lab 0102. And here, I'm trying to make it zoom in, there we are. It could not find the name. This is where it would have said something like Microsoft Visual C. But the names of the sections are UPX1, and the other sections are UPX2 and UPX3. So that is a fingerprint of the UPX hacker. And so it is possible to determine the packer, although it didn't find a name in a place where it expected to find a name. So since it's packed, um, you can unpack it. The UPX unpacker is in here. It's a command line utility. You just have to use it to unpack the malware. And when you do, the Lab 0102, which was only 3K, will unpack. And the unpacked version is much bigger. Unpacked version is 16K, of course, as you would expect. Zipping it made it smaller in addition to obscuring the strings. And if you do the strings in the unpacked version, you'll see much more. And um, when you look at the unpacked things, you'll now see Internet Open URL and Internet Open. And this one will have strings you can use to find the um, command and control center and another thing down here, like I think an IP address. Um, all right, the last string. So the last string is what you use to prove that you got this far. So you see much more information after you unpack it. So those are the first two projects, and I have many more. Um, let me just show you, since just so you know what's coming. It's in my old classes right now. Right now, this is the one I did in China. And so we have a whole lot of these. Um, these are the first couple. Then we got more and more and more here. And even Chinese versions of them, if you want that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but the uh, anyway, I'm, I'm going to convert all these into this class and then add a few more. But um, all right. But that's a start. You should be able to do the first couple homeworks. If you can't submit your, if you can't get your points, just make a note, and I'll hopefully get that straightened out by next week. I must have fouled up my API calls. I'm pretty much a wimp at uh, JSON. I'm just learning how to use JSON correctly, and I don't seem to have the queries working quite right. Anyway, uh, that's all I wanted to show you. Got any questions or anything? Where's well, it? yeah, go ahead. What does it look like when you turn into a homework? Uh, well, if you um, there's a form you fill out at the bottom with your name and the right answer. And if you get the answer right, it then puts your score right in Canvas. So you go to Canvas where you take your quizzes, and your score will appear there. And it works when I test it, but then it didn't work when I tested it right before class. I was able to put it in one person's student's name, but not the other student's. So there's something going wrong with some of the names, and I haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. Uh, does your name have to fully match what's on Canvas? It shouldn't. Even just a few letters would be enough as long as it's unique. Um, but I, 
I'm having trouble. So I'll let you know when I work it out. I, I'm hoping it's something simple like trailing spaces or capitalization, which I can fix in my scripts. But uh, I'll let you know. I've got, I think, now three casters trying to use this system, which doesn't work. This is life. I better get it working. If all else fails, you'll have to send in screen images, but I'm hoping to avoid all that. This is a lot better. We'll see. Any other questions? Uh, the lab, I'm going to go there now if anybody wants to work on anything tonight, but usually that's not too popular the first night. We'll have regular hours next week or maybe the week after as we get a bunch of volunteers. There is a lab on campus to work in, but most people can do everything at home as long as you can run some kind of virtualization software. And like I say, don't put this malware on your main system, but it should be none of it's going to crawl out of the VM and infect anything, and it won't do too much harm even to your main system. The only thing it'll do is pop up boxes and be a little difficult to remove, that's all. Okay. Now, what time yeah. does the lab close usually? Uh, well, normally it's open until 9.30 on any day. That the, and I'll stay there until 9 tonight if anybody wants to work there. Um, but uh, at least till 9.30, and they'll probably have daytime hours too. But not this week. Good. Anything else? Okay. I'm going to clean up and move over there.